Number three. Yes, okay. Hi. Uh, I want to thank everybody for being here, but I want to just raise a point that this is falling up a little bit on the issue of, of rational choice. Most of us here, I think, are outside the lesser of two evils, quoting logic. But as soon as we get outside this room, a lot of people find it rational to vote for the lesser of two evils. That is, there are a great many more people in this country that would agree with the, the principles that have been talked about here, but at the last minute, we'll vote for Obama, will vote for Frank Chop. Unfortunately, they're going to vote for the Democrat. And I imagine on the other side of the spectrum, there are a lot of people who think, you know, Republicans are lesser of evils. And the problem here, I think, the fundamental problem is that we have plurality voting in this country. More advanced democracies have forced representation. And so I'm hoping everything goes very well on election day for the wonderful candidates up here. But if it doesn't, the lesson, I think, is not that the message is wrong. There are millions of people who would agree with this message. It's the structure of our democracy is wrong. And so what I would like is, well, today, but maybe you could wait till the day after election day for us to begin a movement to reform the way we vote, to push for proportional representation. And I'm wondering whether the candidates here, again, let's hope everything goes well on election day. But if it doesn't, how are we going to reform the structure so that this message that you have, which does have millions of supporters, gets the right number of voters? Sure. Um, so just to begin with, I, I agree that you know there is a there is a tremendous amount that can be done to reform the electoral structure uh, and to make the electoral system uh, behave in a roughly a democratic fashion as opposed to what it is today, which is completely and blatantly uh, rigged, uh, you know, in, in favor of uh, corporate politicians. Um, and I think we should definitely. Uh, do whatever we can in our power to, to uh, make that change happen. But I think also that um, ultimately it's not so much a question of the structure. I mean, not, it's not only a question of the structure itself. I'll give you an example. I uh, come from India, and in India we have uh, you know, a parliamentary system, and I often meet Americans who say, we need a parliamentary system. We need a better in your country. Uh, um, well, uh, I'm going to add something to what I'm saying. <laughs> something similar. Uh, so, uh, you know, do, do, shouldn't we have a third party or shouldn't we have many parties? I mean, isn't that better? And of course, yes, it's a no-brainer. Of course it's better. But I want, I want to say, though, that let's be careful. First of all, my first point is we don't want just any third party. I mean, I don't want the right-wing Tea Party. I mean, I don't, I don't want that. <coughs> But that's less important. The more important point is that if you look at uh, countries that have parliamentary systems, the United Kingdom or India, or, you know, pretty much any country that was under the British Empire, really, which was many countries, uh, that simply having that structure does not ensure democracy. So if you look at India as an example, there is any number of parties. I mean, there's so many parties evolving in every second. I mean, it's an alphabet soup of parties that I can't keep track of. And you would think that in all this plethora of parties, there must be one party at least that represents the downtrodden, the lower castes who are equivalent to black and poor in the United States. Uh, but no, in reality, no, because we have a rigged system, not only electorally, but overall, this is, this is a system, a global capitalist system, that because its goal is not human well-being, but maximizing of profits and wealth for a small sliver of population at the top, that system works, finds ways to work for itself regardless of what structure we have. So what I wanted to say is that while we should fight to change that structure, the primary task on our hands is you know, fundamentally transforming society so that it is not run as a corporate oligarchy, so that the wealth is owned by all of us democratically, and so that we can decide what to do with that wealth. We can make the decision that we want no more wars and we want uh, to end hunger and malnutrition, you know, on day one, like you know, right now, let's do that and let's deliver healthcare. That those are the questions we have to grapple with. Yeah. So, um, well said. And uh, you know, I I agree uh, basically with both points of view here that we do need to push forward on electoral reform, <coughs> and that at the end of the day. 
electoral reform isn't going to do it. Um, and, and it sort of it keeps bringing to my mind this saying from the lore of sailors in the 17th century, which is that you have one hand for the ship and one hand for yourself. So it's like we need to work on the things that we're working on, and that includes electoral <coughs> reform. And there are cities around the country that have adopted ranked choice voting, which isn't proportional representation um, that Richard's talking about, but it's another kind of reform that just lets you rank your choices instead of you know, winner take all and, and you only vote for one person. Instead, you get to say, well, this is my first choice, and if my first choice loses, here's my second choice. And that's, that's a great reform, and it's actually being used in a variety of cities in San Francisco, in Minneapolis, and St. Paul. And where it's been enacted, there actually is a little bit more give and take. It's interesting to see things are a little more fluid uh, politically. And there's, it's still new, so we don't yet quite know where it's going, but it does seem like it has given uh, people a much better shot at winning some of these races. So it is a good thing, and we definitely need to go there. At the same time, we passed a very important electoral reform in Massachusetts, which was to get big money out of politics through public financing. We passed it and worked on it for years, and then passed it by a huge majority, by a two to one majority we passed it. And right after we passed it, the, the legislature, which was Democratic, turned around and repealed this law that we had passed as a voter referendum. So it was just another example of how we have to work on the issues, but we also have to change the system at the same time, or they will continue beating us back. So for me, that was a very important kind of wake-up experience. And that was one of the reasons that I was recruited to run for office for the first time in Massachusetts, because here we had just passed campaign finance reform, and then you had the, um, you know, the political predators uh, basically jerking it away from us. So we got to do both. But it is, it is absolutely critical. It's really important to have that electoral reform. It's hard to get people's attention, I find, around electoral reform when they're fighting to keep a roof over their heads to pay for their education and so on. So it's led me to see electoral reform as a piece of a broader agenda. And to my mind, that's what a political party is all about. It's a way for us to come together across issues so that you don't have to work on all the things that need to be done. You can work on your, you know, where your heart moves you while you've got other people that you're working in coalition with who are working on the other things. And then it's just a matter of what is strategic uh, at the moment in real time, how do you put together an agenda to kind of maximize public engagement and uh, public attention in any one given moment or election or campaign, whatever you're working on. Thank you.